from across the globe, from the center of aerospace, and now to you. Thank you for downloading the Aero Society podcast from the Royal Aeronautical Society. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's a great pleasure for us to be here for this lecture. We'll join the list of very famous speakers who had the honor to present at the Royal Aeronautical Society, uh, such as Ellen Sharman, uh, first British woman in space, uh, Bob Crandall, uh, president of American Airlines, and many others. So really, thank you very much for this invitation. Uh, our purpose uh, today is to give you an overview of the latest advances in airport technology and uh, particularly on uh, airport operation functions. Um, I will uh, start by giving you some background on, uh, on uh, airport surface operations and uh, the different solutions that already exist or that are studied. Uh, either on ground uh, or for uh, on board the aircraft, uh, embedded in the aircraft. Then uh, Olivier Frérot will uh, present our uh, current products, not only our current products, products embedded in, into the aircraft and um, uh, what we foresee for the future. So first, about the context, uh, you have to, to know that uh, airports is a very uh, complex and busy, we are going to move that here. It, it's a, a complex and busy environment. Um, uh, as you may know, uh, when they are uh, in flight, uh, the pilots have a lot of aids, especially from the flight management system, that so give a lot of cues to the pilot to, uh, about his flight plan and his trajectory. Uh, but also the surveillance system that gives a lot of uh, information of the traffic that surrounds the aircraft. But when they arrive on ground, uh, they have almost nothing. Uh, the pilot flying has to uh, guide the aircraft uh, looking outside the, the cockpit window. Uh, it's based on visual control. Uh, the pilot non-flying is using static charts. We've got an example of static chart here. Uh, and they follow the voice uh, instructions of the ETC controller. This causes many concerns. Uh, first of all, on the safety critical part of the airport, of course, which is the uh, runways, with runway incursion or, and runway excursion. A runway, inc inc a runway incursion is when uh, an aircraft is on a runway without any authorization. And an, a runway excursion is when an, uh, an aircraft has an inappropriate exit of the runway either beyond the end of the runway or on the sides on, on, uh, of this runway. The other part of the life of the pilot of ground is taxiing between the gate and the runway or between the runway and the gate. And he, he has to lower the time he's, he needs to go from one point to another. And that's uh, another part of, uh, of his duty uh, when he's on ground. So, Due to the increase of traffic and uh, the growth of airport infrastructure, uh, piloting on airport is quite a, a very complex task. To give you an example of um, runway incursion and runway excursions, so you've got figures here. Uh, on, the, on the left, it's on runway incursions, so that's the last FAA report of 2015. So you can see that they are twice a day a runway incursion in Europe and four times a day in the US. So it's not, it's not at all a rare event. It occurs really frequently. Uh, when we are talking about runway excursions, that's the, the graph uh, on the right. The um, orange line represents the number of accidents per uh, um, uh, million sectors. Uh, so that's de decreasing. That's a good news. But among this accident, you can see so that the, the blue bars, that the runway inc excursions uh, always represent between 20 and 25% of the accident uh, globally. So uh, around the runway, there are a lot of concerns and there are uh, improvements uh, to propose uh, for, uh, for aircraft. When we are going to... Um, on the taxiway, 
the first concern in taxiway uh, is uh, the visibility, con visibility conditions. I have a, a, a movie to show you. Uh, so. I don't need the, the sound. Uh, so it has been taken, it has been recorded by um, a colleague of us uh, who is a, a pilot in uh, Brussels Airlines and in, he and is also working at Thales to help uh, engineers design a new product. And uh, he made uh, this movie at uh, Milan Malpensa. It's not always sunny in Italy, as you can see. Uh, and uh, if, you, if you hear, but uh, it's, it's in French, they are counting every intersection uh, they are passing to know where they are on the taxiway. And at what time they have to turn right to, to follow and to, to, to go to the next taxiway. So uh, that's really uh, the, the main, the, the first concern is problem of fog uh, when you are on, a, on an aircraft. But in fact, it's not, uh, it's not the same concern, the, the, the only concern. Uh, you, you also have difficulty when the, the sun is shining uh, very close to the, the horizon. You have direct rays, but you have also reflex on ground that can, hidden, that can hide sorry, the, uh, the instructions and the information that are written uh, on the ground. But in fact, uh, la uh, night is or sometimes uh, can be also difficult because uh, there are sometimes too many lights, so it's difficult to be sure you've got the, instru the instruction from your taxiway. And of course, it's even worse when it's raining. So this picture is a, is a quite funny one. It's sometimes can be confusing because you've got an instruction saying runway red, but you don't see the runway. So it's quite confusing. The pilot has to trust what is written, of course, but because of a little hill in front of him, he doesn't see the runway. So that's a uh, difficulty he can have when he's taxiing on airport. So that's visual condition. When we're talking about static charts, uh, uh, they are, of course, as the airport is, so if the airport is complex, the static chart is also complex, so sometimes you get multiple taxiways. Here, you've got an intersection with almost six taxiways that are crossing at the same point. You have what we call hotspots, which are complex part of the airport. And it's complex when you are on this hotspot, when when... <laughs> Sorry, and I cannot remove this. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> You're not supposed to work after uh, half past uh, seven. Half past seven, yes. I, uh, I have to leave my work now. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> it's finished. <laughs> so, yes, this hot spot is quite complicated, and sometimes the chart is it's even worse with a chart because it doesn't help you a lot. Ah, but I'm going to film this one. <laughs> well, we we prepare the sh the, the speech. Alors, no, on va faire un ça. Ici. C'est là. Moi, j'ai cherché, j'ai pas trouvé. Hein. The demo effect. Je ne pas ce truc, moi. Non. Non, non, je suis en présentation. Allez, laisse tomber. On poussera. Sorry about that. It, it should. Uh... <laughs> Uh, hotspot, and you also need to be sure you've got valid charts. Uh, you know, in uh, aeronautical, uh, in, in aeronautical world, you have charts, and they are um, updated every 28 days. But sometimes there are works on airports that are between these two cycles. 
So your chart is not always valid, and that's uh, something also uh, difficult for the, for the pilot. And last, uh, last uh, concern about situational awareness is about uh, the traffic jam when you are on ground. Uh, <laughs> there are a lot of uh, aircraft taxiing on the airport, and uh, the, uh, there is only one radio frequency for all airports in an area. Uh, there is an ATC controller that is uh, guiding the, all the aircraft with a and only one uh, channel, and you can. Uh, <coughs> so uh, you are going to listen to an ATC controller talking to. Uh, Four seventy one, heavy Kennedy Tower, runway two two right, short line up away. Three eight five hundred cross runway two two right, taxi right on Bravo without stopping. Okay, hey, France Air one one, heavy Kennedy Tower, cross runway turbulence, runway two two right, short and Yankee Alpha line up away. Four seventy one, heavy Kennedy Tower, runway two two right, short and line up away. Crew 500 cross runway 22 right, taxi right on Bravo without stopping. Okay, France Air 11, heavy Kennedy Tower, cross runway turbulence, runway 22 right, short and Yankee Alpha line up on. Right, it was just an, an example to show you the, the speed of their, when they are talking to aircraft. And you have, so they are talking, an ATC controller is talking to all the aircraft on, on, on his zone and uh, on his area. And you have to catch when he's talking to you to be sure it's, he's talking to you and he's explaining where you have to go and which taxiway you have to go. So that's also uh, a nightmare for pilots. And uh, sometimes they, they miss the point and they, they, they ask the ATC con controller to repeat. So all that, uh, uh, it's quite an expensive uh, issue for airlines. Uh, all these incidents, so there are uh, ground damages that cost between four to seven billion dollars a year, either uh, because of injuries uh, from passenger or crew, uh, damages of aircraft, of course, especially in case of runway excursion, or damage to third party. You can have impact on your uh, uh, insurance fee, uh, and there are also indirect costs. Uh, especially impact on fleet management or flight constellations when uh, you have, you've got a problem with your, with your handcraft. So that's the global context of uh, taxiing on airport in, uh, in 2017. What are the different solutions? So uh, a lot of people are working on that subject uh, since several years. Uh, first of all, uh, there are uh, solutions proposed, provided by the airports. Uh, the first one, uh, it's not exhaustive, we just give two, two of them. First one is the taxi boat, which is a, a solution proposed by Airbus. And they are working with an Australian company who has proposed this tractor. Uh, and, with, and they communicated a lot last year on that uh, project because they are on the way uh, to the certification. Uh, so, uh, in fact, it's mainly uh, a green solution because it uh, helps the pilot to, uh, uh, to move from one, pay, one point to another uh, using this tractor instead of uh, the uh, engines of the aircraft. Uh, but uh, on board the aircraft, the pilot has always his charts. He has to look outside the cockpit window to, to pilot because he is piloting the aircraft. He is responsible of the aircraft. Uh, on, the, on the airport. So it's not there are nobody uh, in the tractor to, to guide him on the, on the, on the airport. So uh, it's a green solution, but it almost doesn't help him, help the, the, the crew a lot uh, in terms of workload and situational awareness. Uh, uh, <coughs> the second one, you should know it quite well because at London Heathrow it's de deployed. Uh, it's uh, what is called follow the greens. So it's a system where uh, lights are turned uh, turn, uh, turn on, uh, on green when uh, you are taxiing to show you where you have to go, when, when you have to turn, and they turn uh, red uh, when you have to stop. So uh, it gives you uh, good cues to, to taxi on airport. Uh, it has been proven that uh, with that kind of uh, solution, uh, you win time, so fuel, uh, so you have less fuel consumption. 
Uh, it improves the awareness of the pilot because he has uh, guidance uh, cues uh, to help him. Uh, on the contrary, uh, it will take really a lot of time before having a worldwide deployment of that kind of solution. So when the, the crew arrive in Heathrow, they are happy. And when they are going back to, uh, uh, to Orly or Roissy in Paris, uh, uh, they still haven't any solution. Uh, there's, um, there's no uh, taxi briefing. Uh, you, you need, I mean, you mean a taxi briefing anyway. And uh, so it improves it improve the, the situational awareness, but uh, only uh, it's, uh, you know, a tactical view, not a strategical view from where you are to the, to the gate. And this solution uh, can be proposed by airport, but they are consistent and they can be complementary to onboard solutions. Going to onboard solution, the first solution that has been proposed almost 10 years ago is what we call airport moving map. So you've got a display uh, of, the, of the airport map with uh, the, the aircraft uh, positioned uh, on this uh, map. Uh, you can zoom uh, and uh, you can have uh, heading up orientations. So, uh, and with an heading up orientation, which is the case on the third picture here, you really see in front of you, of your aircraft, uh, on board the, the, the aircraft, what you see uh, looking outside the, the cockpit window. So that's the first, uh, first solution for these different concerns on ground. Um, it has been proven that it improves safety, uh, it optimizes crew workload and reduces stress uh, of, the, of the pilots, and it reduces costs. A few examples. Um, because of the reduction of risk of flight crew errors, it improves the safety. Uh, for one way incursion, I didn't mention it, but uh, you've got uh, alerts when you are approaching a runway, when you've got such, that kind of system. When you are approaching a runway, there is an alert rising up. So you, you, you see uh, you are, uh, so it, it, uh, it um, lowers uh, the number of foreign way incursion. It improves the situation awareness. You, you don't have a static chart, you have a moving map. Uh, and in fact, it minimizes head down time. So the pilots still have to look outside the cockpit window, but it minimizes head down time. That's for the safety. Of course, crew workload uh, are also uh, optimized uh, because the taxi phases is, uh, is uh, easier. Uh, you can anticipate your movement on the next, uh, the next intersection. Uh, you've got le uh, more confidence in your system and where you are and you don't need to re you refer systematically uh, to, to charts. And last, but that's something important for, uh, for airlines, it reduces costs. So uh, as, as uh, follows the green, it has been proven that you reduce time uh, on, the, on, the, on the airport between the gate and the runway. Uh, thanks to that kind of device, uh, it reduces time and it reduces fuel consumption, uh, of course. And also, uh, there are less uh, the damages. And uh, so you can, uh, with that kind of device, you can potentially have cheaper insurance fees uh, because you have less incident uh, when you are taxiing uh, on ground. So that was an overview of the different solutions that are currently uh, uh, exist uh, today. Uh, TaxiBot does not exist today. It will be certified in the following years. And Olivier is now going to describe you a little bit uh, more the different uh, functions of airport operation functions. Thank you, Pierre. Um, so as it has been uh, said earlier in the, in the presentation, the, for this uh, function, the airport moving map, it has been first introduced with uh, the Airbus A380 that you may know in British Airways. And it was certified in uh, 2007. So that's a pretty new product. Um, but since this aircraft, it has been generally deployed on any new commercial air transport aircraft and any new bus jet, starting from the Boeing 787 to the Airbus A350 and the last generation of bus jets, uh, such as Gulfstream bus jets. 
On the regional market, it's uh, still a low penetration rate for this function so far. Um, but in the coming years, we hope it will, uh, it will generalize. Just uh, some slide to give you a quick overview of what are these solutions in the avionics for these uh, recent aircraft, coming with the first, the Airbus A380. This solution uh, of the airport moving map function is based on a dedicated computer that's positioned in the avionic bay, and which is an interface with the cockpit, and especially with the cockpit display. Um, on the navigation display, which is in front of the cockpit crew, air for the first officer and air for the other position, um, you have the display of the airport moving map and an additional uh, information on the airport. Here it's through the airport that is displayed. So you get, for example, the name and the coordinates of the reference point of the, through the airport. This display in front of the, of the, of the crew. The navigation display, obviously, is not originally um, designed for this airport map. It's used in route and flight for the in-route map, the en-route map. Um, and the, the, the crew switches the display from the en-route map to the airport map using the range selector. So there's a mistake here. It's the selector that's up ahead of me. And going below 10 nautical mile radius, you switch from the in-flight map to the airport map. Um, this uh, functionality provides the, the crew the capacity to interact with it. You get a capacity to add annotation on the map and to have some request on airport element. Uh, to interact with this display, it's the track control on the cable that is used. This solution, first introduced on Airbus on the A380, has been then generalized to the single aisle and long range family. But the funny thing with this family is that uh, as their old generation aircraft, they did not get any trackball uh, in the cockpit uh, at, at that time. But at that time, the flights were potentially smoking flights, so they, they each, uh, in each cockpit side, there was a nice tray on the other side. So for the single aisle and long range uh, aircraft, as Flights are no longer smoking, uh, smoking flights. We change for this function the ashtray with a uh, trackball in order to interact with the display. On the uh, Airbus A350, uh, the solution is basically the same. The only difference with uh, what we've seen previously is that the, the function that was embedded in the, in the computer in the Avionix Bay is now embedded in the, through the processing capacity capability of the display directly. So there's no more need to have an additional computer in the Avionics Bay. The Boeing 787 at Thales, we're less familiar with it because it's not our product, but uh, it's basically the same with the airport map on the navigation display position and uh, uh, an interactor through a trackball. Nothing, uh, nothing really different from the A350. On this jet, still, uh, we find the same classical elements, a navigation display highlighted here uh, with the airport map and interaction. But with this jet, as often, there's some innovation that's been introduced and that are not yet deployed on the uh, commercial air transport. <coughs> For example, the touchscreen interactions with a dedicated uh, display that are touchscreen capable and the introduction of um, synthetic vision uh, display on the primary flight display. That's what we've seen in. So, so that when you're in the airport, you have a view of the airport on the navigation display, but also through the primary flight display. So for all these uh, functions to be deployed, there's a couple of enablers that are required. And first of all, as we are talking about displaying an airport map, obviously the system needs to know the, the airport information to display this map. For the airport moving map function, we basically uh, get this data from the aerodrome mapping database, AMDB, that is defined according to an industrial standard, the A rank A16 standard. Um, and it's followed the same rhythm of classical aeronautical database, which is the RX cycle which means that it needs an update every, three, every four weeks, uh, 28 days. 
In this ARANC A16 uh, standard, it defines what kind of airport information we will find in this database, knowing that some of them are optional and others are mandatory. So basically, you have the taxiways, the runways, the buildings, the guidance lines, the holding position, and so on. Everything to build the airport maps. But you have also additional information that may be useful for operations. For example, for runways, you can have the width and the length of the runways, the, um, the distance available for landing or for takeoff. Um, you can have uh, wingspan limitation if it's applicable to uh, some taxiways, something like that. Um, with recent uh, version, since the Dash 2 version of this uh, standard, the, the database is no more only focused on graphical data, but it has been completed with the aerodrome surface routing network which provides a, a, a network on the airport, which gives the possibility to develop new functions that was not possible with only graphical data. And for example, a taxi routing function that we'll see later in this presentation. The ARANC A16 standard also defines several levels of accuracy for the database. For use for airport moving map, we typically use a medium category database which guarantee a five meter accuracy for the main element of the airport, uh, runway and taxiway, for example. And finally, with this database, uh, we've got uh, two main database providers on the market, which are Jepson and uh, Lufthansa system. There's other, but uh, the leaders are Jepson and Lufthansa market. And they got several hundreds of airports uh, available in their database. But the airlines doesn't buy all these airports that are available because the, the selling model of this database provider is based on each airport for each aircraft. So if an airline such as British Airways, get, which got a large fleet, uh, was buying all the, the airports from a, a provider, it would be really, really expensive for, for, for the company, for the airline. So uh, typically airlines are buying only the airports which are the more useful for their operations. 20, 30, 40, depends on of the size and of the operation of the airlines. The second enabler for the function is, uh, is the aircraft position. Indeed, in order to have better situational awareness and to get maximum safety profits from the function, you need to have the aircraft position on top of the airport map. Uh, the goal of having that is to have a good correlation between what is outside the cockpit and what is displayed on the, on the cockpit. So in, in order to have it, you need to have an accurate and reliable and available position on the map. Um, the, the norms, the awareness uh, authorities has defined a minimum system accuracy at 50 meters. One for each, that's fair. Um, so, so it will come again. Uh, so they define a total system accuracy of 50 meters. When we say total system accuracy, it's from the sensor, which is defined the aircraft position, all the way down to the display. Um, so 50, uh, 50 meters, to give you an example, here it's a, a picture of uh, Israel Airport. Um, hope you recognize it, around 27 left runways. And the blue circle, it's a 50 meters radius circle. These 50 meters, they have been defined, uh, not by me, but by the awareness, based on the airport constraints that are applied, especially with respect to spacing between two parallel taxiways. So you see that with this circle, which is quite large, uh, is small enough in order not to induce misleading information that could uh, let the, the crew to think they are in parallel taxiway to the ones they actually are. Where it could induce ambiguity or misleading information is generated at, in, at intersections. Here we see that the, the cycle covers all the intersection, but knowing that the aircraft is displayed with direction, which also has got uh, an accuracy uh, minimum level defined by the overseas, uh, you can uh, reduce the risk of misleading information knowing the direction of the aircraft, even if it's not at the center of, uh, of the intersection, you see the way it's going. But 50 meters, we all agree, it's quite large. And if you want the best function and get 
most, the best credit of the function, we need to have better accuracy. And there are several sources of accuracy. We've seen in the previous slide that the database has a five meters accuracy. We get some accuracy effect linked to the rendering, the display of the map on the aircraft position. There's some uh, inaccuracy linked to the latency effect, the time the system treats the position and display it, the aircraft have moved a, a little. But the main contributor to the inaccuracy is the GPS position in itself. The, now the, the scientific uh, community uh, estimates that the, the GPS position accuracy is uh, 17 meters on ground. But this accuracy is uh, sensitive to many uh, perturbation, atmospherical uh, perturbation, for example, but especially in the airport uh, environment where there's a lot of uh, terminals, buildings, aircraft, there's multipass effects, uh, which means that the uh, GPS signal is reflected from building or uh, metallic structures, which induces inaccuracy in the final position received uh, at the cockpit level. So Thales has defined uh, for, uh, for the Airbus solution uh, a dedicated and specific hybridization algorithm which is based on GPS data, but also on inertial reference data, in order to detect through the inertial reference data any perturbation on GPS signal, in order to passivate, detect and passivate the perturbation of the position. This algorithm has been specifically developed for use in the airport environment, on ground environment and in airport environment, and it got very, very good results because it, uh, it, it enables to reach uh, an accuracy level for the position below five meters. But the, the, the side effect of it is that this algorithm is specifically tuned for, a dedicated, sen for dedicated sensors, and each time you use new sensors or other sensors, you need to retune the algorithm or to adapt it. So as a conclusion, um uh, Onboard airport operation functions provide many benefits. Uh, as, we, uh, as we have seen, it uh, increases safety, it's a source of savings, and it reduces uh, the crew workload, so it improves the efficiency of uh, taxiing on, on airport. Uh, there is a long roadmap in front of us. In fact, we are like the flight management system 30 years ago. Uh, the road is in front of us. Uh, but there is a collaboration to study between uh, the different stakeholders, especially uh, ground solutions that can be combined with onboard solutions. Uh, and uh, we foresee that there will be a new balance between avionics and EFB world for that kind of functions, uh, maybe uh, runway safety critical functions uh, for the runway in the avionics, and when getting out of the runway, uh, you can have uh, uh, an iPad or an EFB to help you uh, uh, to go to the, to the gate. EFB, as uh, Olivier explained, it's much more dynamic and innovative, with, but limited to awareness. So there's a promising future for these functions and a new balance to find between open worlds and avionics. So, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you very much. From across the globe, from the center of aerospace, and now to you. Thank you for downloading from the Royal Aeronautical Society. If you enjoyed this content, please consider showing your support for the Society. Share a link to this presentation by email or on your favorite social networks. If you have an interest in aerospace, consider the professional and personal benefits of membership. Visit www.aerosociety.com.